Good morning once again as we are studying together the Word of God and we're particularly studying the book of Revelation. We are coming near to the end of this great book. I hope that you have gained some great lessons from it as I have. Some lessons that we may never have heard before because we never studied this book before. But certainly it's a blessing to our lives. Blessed are those who read it and who indeed keep it. In Revelation chapter 19, we see it as a case that one of our favorite hymns before we start this chapter is that I like to sing is called Whiter the Snow. And one of the lyrics from that song is that to those who have sought thee, thou never says no. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. It is the case, my friends, that God has never refused anyone who comes to seek Him and to find Him. And the Bible talks about in Isaiah 55, 6, and 7, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake His way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and He will have mercy on him and to our God for He will abundantly pardon. I hope and pray that each and every one of us strive to want to seek the will of God and want to do His will because God never says no. He never refuses anyone who strives to do His will. And so we have sadly seen, though, it is the case that the Jews of the first century, they refused to let God into their lives. They rejected the Messiah. And 40 years later, their city was destroyed. They were indeed that, old, that harlot that is referred to in Revelation 17. They are Babylon. Then we see a prophecy that John gives that this city of Jerusalem would be destroyed by God. And now the prophets, the apostles, and everyone in heaven is to cry out and shout out and say, Thank God for what as God has done for His judgments are righteous and true. God had destroyed this great city. And so we see that we're going to look at the imagery and, the, and, and we're going to look at some impressions that should be made from these ten verses that we're going to be studying. In the Revelation 19, verse 1, the Bible says, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. The word Alleluia literally means praise Yahweh. And so as you sing this, as we sing through songs, it may say hallelujah, hallelujah. It's the same word, praise Yahweh. And this is going to, you're going to see this phrase six times through this song that they sing praises unto God. Notice that they say that salvation belongs to God. It is that which is coming, the Christians had come out of this calamity. They had escaped the hands of Babylon, of Jerusalem. They escaped that city and they were saved in that day. And so we see how they were praising God for allowing them to be, have a safe passage. And so, and we can think of that as an application for us that we should be thankful that God has given us the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ and dying on the cross and that each and every one of us can partake of that gift and that we can have salvation if we obey His will. When He says glory and honor, of course, it's hard to describe. It's inexpressible to me to, to uh, define words on what glory and honor, but the great majestic nature of God and what He continues to do, what He has done, it certainly does belong to Him. And of course, the power that God is all-powerful and is able to crush the Jews, His enemies. And later on, we'll see in chapter 19, when we study further, He will destroy the Roman Empire. So in verse 2, He goes on to say, For true and righteous are His judgments, because He has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And He has avenged on her the blood of His servants uh, shed by her. Notice that the word vengeance, it's used in Luke 21 and Jesus' Olivet Discourse when He said, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. And let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So we see that God will destroy 
this great harlot who sadly made political alliances with other countries, who sadly uh, influenced these countries to, instead of serving God, they rebelled against God. And now God will judge her, and He is righteous and just. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. And we know that sin cannot stand in His presence, and so He must act. And He acted, and He did destroy this great city. But what happened to this city? Well, it says the aftermath of it that again they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises up forever and ever. Notice this is an allusion to Isaiah 34 verse 10, which is the destruction of Edom, showing that Edom would never come to be the city that it once was. Jerusalem would never become to be the city that it once was. Yes, there is a Jerusalem today, but it is not in comparison to the city that it was in the first century. So that's why it says, It shall not be quenched day and night. Its smoke shall ascend forever. From generation to generation it shall let lie waste. No one shall pass through it forever and ever. Well, in verse 4 he goes on to say, And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you His servants, and those who fear Him, both small and great. It is the case that we need to give reverence unto God, both small and great. No matter what economic class we're in, no matter how small we are in society, if we're working at jobs that people don't think are, you know, are like doctors and lawyers, it doesn't really matter. God, God wants everyone, no matter who they are, no matter if it's someone high up in the political office, no matter if it's someone that's high, even low in, on the economic scale, it doesn't matter. God wants everyone to recognize who He is. He's the Creator. He is the Judge of this world. And we are to give reverence to Him. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, 14. So let us give praise unto God and let us never forget the one that is given this honor of worship. He is the only one who is worthy of our worship. And may we ever come to Him with a heart that sincerely seeks to give Him that honor and glory and praise. As Jesus would say in John 4, 23 and 24, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. And God is spirit, and they that worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. May we strive to ever do that in our lives. Well, in Revelation 19, verse 6 through 8, the Bible goes to say this, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. There's a lot in this verse that we're going to unpack, so that's where we're going to spend most of our time. And I want us to look at what this means. For the Lord God, omnipotent, all-powerful, is what that means, reigns. Well, what is this talking about? You remember that we studied the false teaching of realized eschatology, and the reason I wanted to study that is to show you what, sadly, other brethren believe and show you that we should not take what they say, how they sadly will twist the Scriptures. And what they would say about these verses is that they would say that when the destruction of Jerusalem occurred, that is when Jesus began His reign as King of Kings. Now, that goes against what the Bible teaches, and I want to show you that. Here, if you remember, just to give you a recap of what Realized Eschatology was, you'll remember that they believe the idea that everything of the last things, everything, the second coming of Christ, the resurrection, you name it, it occurred in AD 70. And so we see how they believe even the kingdom came in its full power and glory in AD 70. Now, like we said, the Bible teaches, though, that Jesus began to reign when He sat down on the 
Father's right, right hand. And, and we see that in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Jesus, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power when He had, had by Himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You remember in Acts 1, 9 through 11, Jesus descended from Bethany into heaven at the Mount of Olives, and we see how he ascended there, and we see how the angel said, Men and brethren, why are you gazing up in heaven? This same Jesus will come in like manner as he did. And so we see Jesus ascends into heaven, sits, shows the Father that he did sacrifice his life, that he did show forth his blood that he shed, and then, of course, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You know, many priests under the Old Testament, they had to keep on standing, right? They had to keep on offering sacrifice after sacrifice for sin. But Jesus, He didn't have to stand up. He sat down at God's right hand because He was the once for all sacrifice for our sins. And so he sat down at the right hand of God and there's a prophecy that shows that he would rule when he sat down at God's right hand. In Psalm 110 verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your enemies out of, out, out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Jesus is began his reign in eighty thirty. You see, the case is when we study such doctrines like realize eschatology, when we study premillennialism, you remember premillennialism believes the idea that when Jesus came, that the Jew, they, he didn't really recognize that the Jews would uh, basically, uh, he was going to establish his kingdom then, but because the Jews, they nailed him to the cross, and then we see what happens is, uh-oh, I got to put it into another plan, what was called the church is what they would say. And they say that the kingdom will come sometime in the near future. So you can see, what are the dangerous implications of these doctrines? Well, number one is, if Jesus, is the case, had not been reigned from 8030 to 8070, then there was no kingdom. In Colossians 1 verse 13, this would be a contradiction. But Colossians 1.13 says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His dear love. So you can see as the case that the Colossian brethren, they had to be translated out of darkness into somewhere and it says that the kingdom was present. It was in existence at that time. Well, furthermore, this is the most dangerous of all, uh, out of all these false teachings this is why the premillennialism and realized eschatology are systems of infidelity. They're of unbelief. And this is with full blown force what I want to show you. And if you want to mark this in your Bible, I would do this. In Zechariah 6, 12, and 13, I want you to think about this. If Jesus is not on His throne, if Jesus is not reigning, then He cannot be our high priest we cannot receive salvation. Because there is a prophecy that would show that as Jesus was being king, then He is also high priest. The two go together. You separate one, you must separate the other. And so we must see what Zechariah 6, 12 and 13 says, And speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, from his place he shall branch out and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. So that's why we recognize what is this passage trying to say for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Well, I could show you that what we can learn is from Luke chapter 21 when Jesus is giving his Olivet Discourse. He's discussing the destruction of Jerusalem. Notice what Jesus says. Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and well know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom or the reign of God is near. Now that's something interesting. 
I thought that the kingdom had already come into existence, Shane. Well, let me show you what Jesus means by this. He says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. What I'd like to show you is that the kingdom of God did begin His reign uh, in, as we saw in AD 30 when He ascended and at God's right hand. As Jesus would say, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Forty years later... Christ would show a display of His power, would show a display of His reign by showing that He was reigning and that He would destroy those Jews for rebelling against Him. That's what we see in Matthew 26, 62-64, if you want to write that down. Because you remember that at His trial it says, And the high priest arose and said to Jesus, do you answer nothing? What is it that men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said to them, It is as you said. He, he was saying, You know that I am the Son of God. Nevertheless, I say to you, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. What is Jesus alluding to? He's alluding to that He will destroy these people for rebelling against Him. This is talking about, no doubt, talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. That's why Luke records that the kingdom of God is near. God's reign, His display of His power was shown on the destruction of Jerusalem. So that's why we read, The Lord God omnipotent reigns and that Christ will keep on destroying His enemies. Christ will stand up for His kingdom. He wants His kingdom to go forth, march on and fight, and hopefully that people will turn and be converted to the Gospel of Christ. Aren't we thankful for that? Well, he goes on to say, Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife has made herself ready and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Aren't we glad when we see uh, when we go to a wedding, and of course every, everyone rises, and we see the bride come out, all beautiful, all uh, it's just amazing to see her beauty, and we see her come up to her husband, for she has made herself ready. Well, let's see what this is talking about. We can see that the, the history goes back, we have to go back a little bit in Israel's history, and that God married Old Testament Israel. Well, let's look at this. In next, we find this in, Acts, in Exodus 24, 1 through 8. If you want to jot that down, you'll see that God made a covenant with her, and, that God, and the people agreed that they would keep this covenant. In Ezekiel 16, Let's read this where it says, Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations, and say, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, Your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite, and your mother a Hittite. As for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. And you were not rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes, no, I pity you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you. But you are thrown out into the open field when you yourself were loathed on the day you were born. And when I passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. I made you thrive like a plant in the field. And you formed, your hair grew, but you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed your time was a time of love. And I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you and you became mine, says the Lord God. You see, God indeed married Old Testament Israel. But as we re and we see that, what does it say about Old Testament Israel as a wife? Well, it says, for your maker, your God, is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. Now, as we well know, what happened to the marriage between God and Old Testament Israel? 
Well, as we read about it in the book of Hosea, sadly, many times, the heart of Israel was given over to another. They allowed their lives to be worshiping idols. They committed spiritual fornication. They committed spiritual adultery against God. They broke the heart of God. And God called them back say, I love you. I want you to return to me. And they would not change their minds. They would not repent. And it's sad to see that take place. In Jeremiah 3, verse 14, G, uh, the, Jeremiah records saying, Return, O black sliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And Isaiah 50, verse 1 says, Thus says the Lord, Where is the certificate of your mother's divorce? whom I have put away, or which of my creditors is it to whom I sold you? For your iniquities you have sold yourselves, and for your transgressions your mother has been put away. So as we can see, what is the reason that God divorced Old Testament Israel for? It was for fornication, for spiritual fornication. And we see that God has the right to remarry someone else. And to whom would He remarry? He would marry the church of Christ. And so what we see here, brethren, is Isaiah 62, 2-5 gives a prophecy of this new wife that He would marry in contrast to the harlot, to the Old Testament, Jerusalem. The Bible says, "...the Gentiles shall see your righteousness." And all kings your glory, you shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. Isn't that what occurs when a couple is married, that the wife will take the name of her husband? You shall also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no longer be turned forsaken, nor shall your land any more be turned desolate, but you shall be called Hephzibah, and your land Beulah. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. That's why we see that Jesus marries the church. There are many that were joined to Him, and 3,000 souls were added to the Lord's church. We see that they were married to Christ Jesus. In fact, we see how Paul records in saying, Therefore, my brethren, you have also been dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to Him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, Paul says, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And of course, the verse, the verse of all verses that talk about marriage, Ephesians five twenty two through twenty seven. Wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be their own husbands in everything. Husbands love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her, that He might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that He might present to Himself a glorious church. You see, that is the verse that belongs in Revelation 19 where we see Jesus wants to present her gloriously in all her beauty, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So, after we see Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, God wants us to recognize who his wife is, that is the church. You see, probably over those 40 years, what did is Old Testament Israel think? They thought they were the wife of Christ, or thought they were the wife of God. They thought that they were being faithful to God, but they were not. And God divorced her for her spiritual fornication. And we see that God remarried a new Israel, the church of our Lord. So we see that the harlot is destroyed. 
we see that she is no longer recognized as the wife of God, obviously, and that we see Christ wants to present to the world a glorious church, His church, His body, that it belongs to Him. So that's why we could see that the timeline of this case of Jesus married His bride in AD 30, many of those who are obeyed the gospel were added to Him. And we see also as a case that Christ in AD 70 Display, makes a display of his beautiful bride. This is to be recognized as his bride, the church of our Lord. So we must recognize and remember what the Bible teaches. You remember the reason why God divorced Israel? It was for spiritual fornication. And we must remember that for our marriages, sadly, there takes place many people who are in unscriptural divorces because they do not heed the words of Jesus Christ and that they must remember that there is only one reason that God has granted the innocent party to divorce their guilty spouse. And that is for fornication. As he says in Matthew 19, verse 9, And I say to you, whosoever divorces his wife except for fornication and marries another commits adultery, and whosoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Well, in verse 8, he goes on to say, And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. What do we need to remember, brethren? We need to remember that we are to keep the Lord's church pure, that we are to be unspotted from the world, that we are to be kept pure to Christ, be faithful to Him in our vows, because we confess He was Lord of our lives and that we will fit to the end, that we will stand faithful. Because that's what we say in our vows as a married couple, that we will be faithful unto death. And that's what we're to do for, for us as well. Because as James 4 verse 4 says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore make, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. But well, we see how in Revelation 19 verse 9 10, the Bible says, Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant. And of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Let me just deal with the first part. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, of course, you remember the marriage supper in ancient times. It's not like today where we have a, a you know, just a, a, res, a, well, I can't even think of the word for it now. We have a feast right after our, our marriage. And, of course, you know, it'll last a, re, a rehearsal. Not a rehearsal. Well, never mind. You know what I'm talking about. But basically we go through that and, uh, we, you know, it lasts for just a couple of hours. And for poor people, you know, we see how the case that, you know, they would maybe last for a day, but for those who were rich, they would last for seven days. You remember Jesus was invited to a wedding in Cana in John chapter 2, and he attended the wedding feast that probably this lasted for several days because of how many gallons that they had, over 160 gallons. And so we see that this would last for quite a while. And so we see that in Revelation 9 verse 10, blessed are those who are called. Well, who is called? Well, everyone is actually called, but sadly not everybody will answer the call, will they? I want to read to you the parables of Jesus and what he said. He said in Matthew 25, verse 1, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish, and those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Surely I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore you know neither the day nor the hour 
in which the Son of Man is coming. You see, it is the case, brethren, that we all must be ready. Everyone must be prepared. And those of us who are faithful Christians are prepared. We are the five virgins who are keep being pure, we're being faithful, and we're ready, and we're prepared to meet the Lord. And sadly, there are many of those who act like those five foolish virgins who are unprepared, who will sadly not be able to attend the great marriage feast because the Lord invites everyone to come, but sadly, many will come. Many will not come because they're unprepared. Matthew 22, verse 2. Listen very carefully. If you want to write this down in the margin of your Bible in Revelation 19, I would urge you to do so. Notice the allusions. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. And they were not willing to come. Of course, those were the Jews. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. Well, what did the Jews do, brethren? He, they killed Jesus, the servants of God, the prophets. They destroyed them. Well, it says, but when the king heard about it, he was furious and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Now, what do you believe that is an allusion to, brethren? It's the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready. But those who are invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. Invite all the Gentiles to come. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to the servants, Bind him hand to foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. It must have been the case that this man who did not come in with a wedding garment was an unfaithful child of God. A man who was, as it says, not dressed in the fine linen in what a wedding garment was supposed to be composed of as we find in Revelation 19, verse 6, that are the righteous acts of the saints. These people, this person must not have been faithful to God, and sadly we see that they were unprepared. They, were, they kept themselves unprepared, and sadly they had opportunity to change, but they did not. And so we see how it is the case that there are going to be, sadly, many Christians probably who are not going to remain faithful to the Lord. That's why we need to look at ourselves, examine ourselves in the faith, because we see that everyone is called by the gospel because God said, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, but not everyone's going to respond. Not everyone's going to answer the call. No one's going to obey the gospel. And sadly, we can be like many of those Jews. And sadly, there are going to be many people who, you know, I have something else to do. They think they have more greater priorities. And so they're going to be unprepared. Because the Lord's going to come at an unexpected time. And then, of course, people want to be right with God, but then it'll be too late. And so we need to ask ourselves, are we willing to respond to the invitation to come to the great wedding feast and to partake of the blessings that God wants to give to us? But we must respond to that invitation. Well, Revelation 19, verse 19, He said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You know, Jesus truly is the essence. He is the spirit of prophecy. Everything in the Old Testament points to him. He is the right Messiah. There, yes, there were many Messiahs who came and went, but Jesus fits the profile. He's the one that we are to look for, that we were looking for. And it's to Him that we are to give our lives to. And I ask you today, are you willing to give to the Lord your life? Because all things are ready. You know, God sent forth His Son when the fullness of time came. He had everything prepared. 
through all the kingdoms that had came and fallen, through the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, they all contributed to something where the gospel could be spread in a universal language, where there were roads built. And God had prepared this, and He wanted the people to come. But sadly, there are many who refuse that invitation. Are you going to refuse the invitation? I hope not. I pray that you will walk down this aisle and desire to want to become a Christian, that you will want to partake of the spiritual blessing because all things are indeed ready. It's whether you desire that choice to come to the feast. Will you come? While we stand and sing the invitation song.